Excellent. So welcome to all of you. We're very glad to have you here. Uh, this is going to be a conversation that I am honored to chair on global value change for regional development, mobilizing trade and foreign direct investment for economic development, which is co-hosted by the Department of Geography and Environment and the School of Public Policy of the London School of Economics. So we have an outstanding panel with us here today. Uh, first of all, the co-authors of the book Harnessing Global Value Change for Regional Development, uh, Professor Ricardo Crescensi and economist Oliver Harman. Uh, thank you. I also have the pleasure of having here Anna Novik, uh, who is Head of Investment at the OECD. <laughs> also with us, Peter Berkov, Policy Director at the Director General for Regional and Urban Policy of the European Commission. And very glad to welcome as well Joachim Oliveira Martins, Special Advisor to the EU Commissioner for Cohesion and Reforms. Well, the objective of today's discussion is to converse about the concept of global value chains as catalysts of regional development, both from an academic a way, an academic perspective, but also a, a policy perspective. We see many students here and many uh, people that are interested in, in policy making as well. And when you get to read that book, you will get to see a lot of uh, um, very relevant conclusions and proposals on how to create, think, and implement uh, policy responses uh, in this, in this uh, topic that has us gathered here today. So in order to do this, the running order of the day is that I will start by giving the word to our two co-authors, Ricardo and Oliver, who will be discussing the main findings of their book. Then we will hear the thoughts of Anna, Peter, and Joachim, respectively. And I will return briefly to our authors so you can have a quick reaction on our experts' comments today. And then I will open the floor for your questions, comments, uh, here um, to all of you that are here in, the, in, the, um, in, in this place, in this venue, but also to all of those of you that are online. So for those of you that are online, you can start uh, whenever you, you want to type your brief uh, uh, questions and please make sure that you uh, write down also your name and your affiliation. For those using social media, the hashtag of today's event is hashtag LSE Harnessing GVCs. Um, and this event is being recorded in the hope we can provide for a podcast afterwards, uh, technology uh, permitting. And after this, we're going to be having a cocktail for all of you outside uh, this venue. So um, I, without any further ado, I pass on the word to the authors, Ricardo and Oliver. The floor is yours. I need to take myself off mute. Oh, goodness, there's new power. Um, okay, thank you everyone for coming. Yeah, I'm going to take us through the first part a little bit of the, uh, the book, I suppose. We're not going to go through it like chapter by chapter because I don't think that would be particularly interesting for anyone, and I'm sure any interested parties will read through it. But I think it's just useful to kind of prime everyone a little bit as to some of the content, and then we can have the dialogue a little bit more well uh, Center, I suppose. So yes, this is our title, Harnessing Global Value Change to Regional Development. And so I think it's important to do a few things. One, I suppose, is, yeah, what is a global value chain? Because I'm sure there's some people who don't know. I didn't really know when I started uh, writing this. Um, no, uh, why don't matter for regional development? I think that's another part that's kind of key in this, um, in the title, I suppose. How to, how regions can harness them? Um, because this is kind of a regional, this is a subnational story. Then I'm going to pass over to Ricardo, who will do a much more stellar performance of kind of how regions can upgrade and looking particularly at this sort of building, embedding and reshaping, which are the three kind of core chapters to the book. 
Then we're going to talk a little bit about the kind of public policy aspects, both the horizontal engagement and these vertical engagement sides of things. And then we'll talk about the future of global value chains as well. So that's kind of how we're going to go today. The three key takeaways that I kind of would like people to hopefully have in their minds, um, and if you don't take much else away today, try and take this. The kind of contributions we try and make is, yeah, this regional or subnational lens, right? I think a lot of the literature on global value chains just views them in these kind of big abstract trade flows, but ultimately they all touch down in space in some city and region or somewhere. And that's kind of one of the reasons potentially to read this. Um, also, I think it provides, and I would say this, you know, an interesting illustration of yeah, FDI and how that can drive this process of upgrading. And I think people often see these financial flows to regions, but it's like what to actually do with those financial flows, which is quite important. And how that links within the actual broader global value chain framework. And this is another bit that kind of had had a little bit of a disconnect. And I think finally, this contribution, you know, of this dyn dynamic kind of specialization as well, um, in the context of kind of global value chain participation, I think this changing economic environment and these changing competitive or comparative advantages are quite critical to engage and sort of, I suppose, yeah, a little bit of this evidence based public policy, which you'd expect for a policy impact book, um, how to get on the chain is also there. So global value chains. Um, you know, this I think is a nice chart. This kind of shows global value chains in the academic field, I suppose. A lot of people were talking about them for quite a long time. Around 2000s, they started kind of popping up in books a lot more. Um, I think actually, yeah, there were like 200 Google Scholar references at the turn of the, cent uh, turn of the millennium, and now there's like tens of thousands. So they've become this kind of new force in, uh, you know, university academic discourse. But what we didn't necessarily see was how that was translating or permeating through to kind of general policy dialogue. And this is just kind of from Google Trends by comparison, there wasn't quite the same um, drivers. And this is just kind of an intuition that we that we felt. And this interesting is slightly changed, I think, uh, with the COVID pandemic, when a lot more people started talking about global value chains, because I think semiconductors weren't getting shipped out of China, and therefore lots of people didn't have PlayStation. So I think uh, that was like a big driver, and everyone suddenly got quite annoyed and went, what, why is this happening? Um, so that's a little bit about, I suppose, yeah, that started there. So what, it, what they are, and this is kind of, I think, one of the only quotes we'll have, but Gary Gareffi is one of the forefathers of global value chain. So you have to have a Gary Gareffi quote at all points. And it describes this, the full range of activities that firm and workers perform to bring this product to market. And I think that's interesting from its, it's from its conception to its end use. And it's not just the production side of things, it's also, this design, marketing, distribution. So these are the whole kind of the whole chain of value added, I suppose, across the global uh, aspect. So hence global value chain. And I think what, why they're, they're useful and it's useful to think about is that it moves us from this, well, I suppose this is kind of the, you know, econ, economics 101, they kind of say, look, we're gonna be trading in final goods and services. This is your cloth and your, wine right if you make cloth we'll make wine and we'll both trade and we'll both be better off and this was kind of the narrative that we've had for many years but what we why we think global well, why global value chains are important is they drive this new kind of competitive advantages in intermediate goods and services so we have a mild bit of interaction you know how many goods do you see here in this bicycle out of interest if someone can shout out a number and uh like is it just one or do how many, how, you know, what are these kind of intermediate goods that are dry, that are behind this in a way? Um, I see my colleagues pointing, uh, 700. 700, nice. We'll go for that, but I don't actually have the correct number and I should. I know in the in a BMW, which was the other one we sometimes use, there's like 16,000 intermediate goods, right? So people just often see a car and people say build a car industry, but actually you can be producing or designing any one of these 16,000 bits. Um, and this comes through a little bit here with this bicycle. You know, you can see the saddles, the brakes, the wheels, the frames, and those with good eyes will be able to tell, you know, actually each, in this place it's national, but you know, each different kind of country is having the, has a specialism in each one of these goods to a different extent. So China's kind of particularly focused on these saddle exports, but uh, you know, Japan on the pedal. So this is kind of the narrative we're trying to, and what the evidence says, you know, driving these sort of um, intermediate goods and focusing on these a bit more. And this is the other point, right? How to upgrade through them. And Ricardo will go into a bit more detail in this later, but I think it's useful to think
think about this framing now. So let's take breaks, for example. You have these kind of two different ways which you can upgrade. There's the horizontal upgrading, and this is often the kind of first kind of upgrading in a way. So you look, if you're Singapore and you're producing a lot of breaks, you could go, okay, what's a slightly more higher value thing we could do? Okay, well, maybe we move from bicycle breaks to car breaks, and that's some way that we can drive the development. And then there's this other one, vertical upgrading, which is kind of a little bit more than the story that uh, we talk about in the book, which is moving from producing bicycle brakes to kind of designing them. And that's where they like the increased value add is. And it doesn't have to be design, it can be marketing, it can be uh, logistics, and I'll touch on this in a moment. But this is kind of the new, um, the new kind of regional development paradigms that we try and um, talk to. So why do they matter for regional development? is the second part I'll talk about. And this is kind of what I was, yeah, beginning to touch upon uh, in the last slide. And this is, we quite like this, it's called the smile curve. And we see this smile curve as an opportunity for development. So we, I'm not gonna use the laser because I'll probably end up taking someone's eye out here. But uh, you can see the kind of production at the bottom. These are typically the kind of lower value added tasks and services that people are involved in. And they're these kind of tangible activities. And what I think the book is talking about how to harness global value chains is move, moving on up these kind of this smile curve into these higher value added activities, whether it be this design, whether it be marketing. Um, and actually what we've seen over the past 30 years, you can see the kind of old smile curve there and you can see they're not quite as happy in the 1970s. But as the fragmentation of trade has kind of happened and through the kind of global drivers of globalization and such, um, this smile curve has become a lot steeper. So actually the, the real value added kind of tasks, jobs and services are on the edges of these, this smile more than the kind of uh, the production side of things. Um, and I think why they also matter for uh, regional development is, well, and this is what some of the evidence we kind of talk about in the, in the book is they are a huge amount of global trade. A kind of a, uh, there's different statistics, but the one here, you know, they're over 50% of global trade today. So, and I don't think people always think about that or talk about them when they talk about global trade. They kind of, people talk about global trade generally, but these are huge drivers of it. And actually in all sectors, global value chain participation is increasing. And that's kind of, um, we've seen that, yeah, from 1995, 2011, when the study was done. And what I think is also useful to touch on here is that even if a region isn't necessarily exporting, they're still kind of having these uh, goods uh, imports coming into their region, which will ultimately, um, you know, so they're in a way they are participating in global value chains because even if they're not exporting, they're still kind of competing against imported goods. And the other thing I think is quite interesting is that actually global, global value chain participation drives um, income level increases at a much, at a higher rate than a, trade itself normally kind of and that's where I think these because of these kind of value added aspects uh, come from and they see this you see higher faster growth in labor productivity and I think what's particularly pertinent here is this higher growth is in more prominent in lower income countries so it's a way that lower income countries can actually catch up with the frontier um, final one for me how to harness global value chains um, and this is a contribution from others but I think it's something that's kind of quite core in the narrative you know, this is kind of the old paradigm of regional or economic development generally, but regional development as well. This kind of, and I'm sure many of us in this room have seen this, this kind of move from commodities through to manufacturing, through to services. This is like the classic going from low to high value added sectors, but in final goods. But of course that can't necessarily carry on forever because we can't all just trade in services, you know. And so what I think a lot of the narrative comes in where the evidence shows is this new paradigm that we want to be shifting towards, which is on tasks. So rather than sectors looking at tasks, and these are these low to high value added kind of activities, right, with this focus on the intermediate goods. Um, and you'll see here, if you kind of, um, if you turn that second arrow on its side, it is almost a smile in a way because, or at least one half of the smile, because you've got that basic production and assembly in the middle, which are those kind of lower value added uh, tasks and services. And then there's a way that we can kind of move on up into these higher ones, looking at design, commercialization, and then ultimately these very high kind of value added uh, um, jobs and tasks around kind of R&D and uh, specialized services and the like. So I think that's kind of a useful framing. I believe I'm passing on to Ricardo just after 
this, but I've kind of touched upon that, right? These firms, countries, and um, regions moving onto these higher value added activities to increase the benefits. So, Ricardo, over to you. How do we do it? Play, pray tell. Thank you, Oliver. So, the, the question is how we So, once we have like, understood that how value added is distributed along the chain, then the key question for policymakers becomes how can regions actually climb? The value chain and position themselves rather than changing sectors. How can they move into segments of the value chain that attract more of the value? Value? So that's the question. The fundamental question that we try to address in the book is basically telling policymakers at the local and the regional level, but also at the national level, how important global value chains can be for economic development of the countries, and then review. The, the, the literature and offer some evidence based advice on how to upgrade and not that shape. So, how regions can do that? But the first thing that they need to do is to understand the actors. Like, what are like the, these value chains do not exist in a lot. They are made of interactions where firms exercise power. So, there is something, there are entities that control the chains. And there can be the, the literature identifies two types of chains. Uh, buyer driven chains where basically the orchestrator is mostly controlling different suppliers that are presented to the market, to the final consumer through that. So that's the example of having Tesco, for example, having or organizing different producers and bringing their products to the market. On the other side, we can have supplier driven uh, value chains where, like the uh, mostly controlled by multinational firms, where uh, big companies are orchestrating multiple supplies that provide them with inputs to generate the final products. And you can see how these different configurations lead on the one hand different power structures. On the other hand, they give policymakers different type of counterparts because they are dealing with different entities that control the chain and that they with which they need to engage if they want to attract segments of the chain. So if they want to enter the, 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 the global value chains through some of the steps of the chain and possibly the move up towards the most uh, value-added intensive uh, uh, steps of the chain. So the, how do we link the global value chains and regions? So that's our like GDC group way to walk. So what we have usually seen is the region and regions dealing with foreign direct investments. That's also how most of the policies for internationalization are designed. Looking at foreign direct investment either as like macroeconomic flows or as individual events that sort of like land on the regions as leaders. Then the literature has also considered the role of multinationals as agents that are responsible for these investments and agents that have their own strategies. So when policymakers interact and think about foreign direct investments, they interact with strategic actors. And we have highlighted how different type of actors, different type of multinationals play a different type of game with the regions themselves when making their strategic decisions or pursue different functions with different objectives. But what we add in the book is really, okay, you need to look at foreign direct investments, they, they, they link uh, between the local and the global within the wider global value chain framework. But this changes the way in which you consider uh, uh, these connection between the local and the global level. This is part of the contribution that the book tries to present to policy. So how do we like, understand the connection between the regions and the value chain? The way in which we conceptualize this idea is advising policymakers to look at three fundamental dimensions. The first dimension is building global value chains. So how do you build the connectivity with global value chains? How can regions present themselves to the key actors that generate, that make global value chains land on the ground? First step. The second key pillar is how you embed these nodes in the value chain. You don't want to build cathedrals in the desert. You don't want to have uh, foreign firms operating in the regional economy with total isolation. So the key question is how do you make sure that investment, that the, the nodes of these complex value chains are embedded and become part of the local environment? The third important area is reshaping global value chains. How we can use public policies in order to actively engage with global value chains as part of our local and national development strategies. 
So the book is organized, like the three main chapters of the book are basically organized and provide evidence around these uh, three key themes. So the, the fundamental like policy message that is like what I think is important for Alliance tonight, but also in order to uh, uh, keep off uh, the, the conversation with our uh, speakers uh, tonight is how do we engage with global value chain? And so if we think about like a global value chain, we can think about the chain that Oliver uh, described before. We can think about like multinational firms playing a key role in orchestrating true ownership in the case of supply driven or buyer driven value chains or drive different types of relationships. But we can think about like major global actors orchestrating the chain and controlling activities, uh, for example, through foreign direct investments that then touch the ground. Okay, that's the type of framework that we are considering, like foreign direct investment as a link between the global and the local level as part of the wider orchestration of the global function. So when we think about public policies and uh, uh, local regional development policies, but also national development policies, we can think about a horizontal engagement with the value chain. The horizontal engagement is something that has to do with, if you want, the traditional portfolio of uh, development policy. So when we think about engaging with value chains horizontally, we think about telling regions, okay, you should invest in our infrastructure because these uh, foreign firms will need to interact with their suppliers. We need to ship input and then the, the final products or other intermediate products elsewhere. So uh, our infrastructure will matter, soft infrastructure and connectivity as well as human capital, for example, as well as innovation, depending at which stage, in particular, if we are interested in design, R&D, but like the local uh, level of uh, research and development, spillovers from other like, existing companies, we make a lot uh, for uh, the, 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 the foreign company operation of the market. But also the general framework in terms of legislation, standards, certifications, as well as uh, tax incentives that have been widely used by policymakers in the area. But if we think about these policy messages, they are not very different from what has been the traditional, if you want, portfolio of uh, targets for local and regional development policies without bringing in the global value chain story. These things are good, even if you look at the problem from a standard, I don't know, uh, endogenous growth theory perspective, these targets would not be very, very different. So what is the value of it? These are also important drivers we show in the book when it comes to engaging with global value chains. So you want these conditions to be in place in order to be able to engage with value chain, embed value chain, and reshape value chains. However, the fundamental message that comes from the book uh, is that the new global order calls regions to engage vertically with global value chains. So you need to make sure that your like regional strategy is directly understanding how value chain work and directly engage with them. And so this brings into the picture a, most, a more sophisticated set of policy tools that are designed to interact with the global environment, that are designed to interact with the global players. Uh, we are discussing about investment promotion agencies that can take different names and different natures, uh, special economic zones, uh, special investment zones, depending on different countries, when they are designed properly, and that's the type of advice that we try to give in the book, they can become strong tools in order to create this global, locally, this uh, uh, GDC group uh, that we have uh, presented before. So horizontal and vertical engagement. Let me zoom in into what the vertical engagement consists of. So the vertical engagement, first and foremost, uh, has to do with uh, um, uh, regional governments directly engaging with the framework conditions that are needed for investment and trade. So this means that, for example, trade deals are not something that is completely the, the, uh, left with the uh, central national authorities. Regional and sometimes uh, uh, municipal city level authorities need to be involved because Different characteristics of trade deals have significant implications on the ground for the different types of funds, for the different types of jobs that dominate local. Or uh, uh, regional lobbying, so how regions can lobby in order to uh, make sure that these wider agreements reflect 
their true uh, developmental interests and strategies. Another important part of the story has to do with regional certification. For example, denominations of origin, something that brings local products to global markets, that certifies their characteristics and makes them unique in the global market. Denominations of origin are an important area uh, uh, in this. Uh, and for example, the European framework is particularly important in this area. And this is particularly important for less developed regions and rural regions, for example, if you think about the nominations of origin in agriculture, for example. This is a relatively like, non expensive policy, but can facilitate the link between the global and the local uh, level. But it needs a vertical engagement. You need to understand what are your strengths and project them on global markets. However, if we think about a more like proactive approach uh, in terms of engagement with uh, uh, global value chains, we can think about the role of investment promotion agencies, national and regional investment promotion agencies that can play a key role in establishing this link in attracting foreign direct investments, acting, uh, as we say, as plumber of the local investment ecosystem. Here, it's not really about uh, uh, advertisement. It's not about any on the local tube uh, advertisements of uh, hundreds of uh, uh, European regions who attract tourists and ideal investors. Here, it's adding uh, uh, local level units that can facilitate the establishment of foreign direct investments into the local ecosystem, into the local environment. That can address not only information asymmetries, but also failures in. Uh, uh, the local uh, uh, investment environment. And this becomes crucially important because it can be a stepping stone, it can be the first way in which you can initiate the process of institutional change at the local level. Sometimes we tell regions you should improve your institutional environment, but we don't tell them where to start. Well, we think this is a nice way to get started. Uh, uh, in, this means designing strategies that target specific sectors, so it's not the whole ecosystem. There's an ecosystem specific to the sector, to the value chain segment that we're trying to address and work proactively with investors in order to build the environment around that. And this can be, and we have we show evidence in the book, uh, as something that can trigger a wider process of change in the local economy. So it's how to get stuck, how to get a stepping stone in the process of institutional change. Of course, attracting investment is not enough. This is what the uh, investment promotion agencies have often, existing investment promotion agencies have often focused on the attraction of investments. But what really also matters is building the connections. And that's why the book insists on the local content, on adding proactive efforts in order to create the links between foreign companies, between these stepping stones that we manage to attract from global value chains into local firms that are often not directly involved into the global value chain. Only the frontier firms directly interact with the chain. But when we think about local economic development, in particular in the less developed region, the problem is how to make this process inclusive and bring into the picture a significant share of domestic firms and give them opportunities for development and upgrade. So the final point that we uh, that we like to make with you is that a lot of the emphasis uh, from the investment promotion and the uh, FDI literature has pointed towards the importance of foreign direct investment in terms of inward investment. I didn't even need to mention that. I didn't qualify the investment. I said FDI. We immediately talked about the foreign investor coming to the region. However. What an increasing body of evidence is showing is that the internationalization of domestic firms is also a very important part of success for the local environment in terms of employment, in terms of innovation, in terms of growth opportunities. So it's not only about any investors coming to the region, but that's about domestic firms investing abroad. And you can see how this message is important, in particular in the current environment, as some of the speakers we discussed. The geopolitical tensions, COVID 19 disruptions are like pushing for a reshoring for our economy to close up. So, the idea of facilitating foreign investments by our domestic firms might seem uh, in contradiction with the need to create local jobs. But what the increasing body of evidence is showing is that such a trade off doesn't exist. Uh, giving, pushing our firms to invest, domestic firms to invest abroad is part of the creation of a two-way communication channel that is beneficial to local employment, innovation, and economy.
So let me like briefly conclude just with some reflections on the on the future. Okay, presenting a book in the current like geopolitical environment on global value chains without mentioning and without the reflection. Okay, we wanted to produce an evidence based book. So there isn't much evidence on the impact of COVID 19, of the conflict in Ukraine, on the energy crisis, on global value chains. So what we try to do in the book, rather than uh, do a uh, guesswork, is really like just to try and outline the issues as an agenda for, for future research. And we really need to think about how this dynamics is going to change the fundamental uh, organization of global value chains and their impact. Work from home the patterns they, they brought about by the pandemic are going to change the way we can deliver services remotely, for example. The underlying restructuring of global value chains and they fundamentally change public policy space. Okay, the recovery plan in Europe, uh, in, in uh, the US, were simply unthinkable uh, in the previous crisis. Okay, the huge amount of resources, the significant role of the government into the economy was completely unthinkable before. So these things change uh, the way we should think about global value chains. And we can think about global value chains also as important. Uh, drivers for the achievement of the two key transitions that are the core, for example, of the EU uh, recovery plan, the green transition and the digital transition. It's very important to think about returns in the value chain as important actors to be leveraged for the greening of the value chain. And by targeting the returns, we can bring about the process of greening of the value chain and then touch down on the ground and can be an important lever to facilitate the green transition in the regions where the value chain is embedded. So we can see how uh, dealing with global value chains, embedding, reshaping uh, uh, value chains and building them can facilitate the green transition in the region, as well as play a very important role in the digital transition. When we think about the importance of uh, uh, artificial intelligence and digital technologies in the way in which, for example, services are delivered, in the new ways in which goods are produced, we see that these changes have played a fundamental role in the reorganization of global value chains along the three dimensions that we discuss in the book. If we think about digital technologies, it's clear that what can allow building value chains, the attraction factors for the local economy with reference to value chains are going to change because lots of things I can do remotely. Uh, I can coordinate across distance. So, how are the attraction factors of regions? See this local economy change as a result of the digital uh, transition. How their impacts on the local economy is going to work if I can control activities in completely different uh, localities? How can I generate local benefits? How I bet the value chain? And how I can use public policies in order to reshape uh, the value chains, taking into account uh, how uh, the uh, industry 4.0 is going to change the, the productive class. Okay, these are like mostly questions. We have no answers, but I think it's very important to present policymakers with a framework. And we think the book presenting the framework works in order to uh, uh, start the conversation on these two issues. So, like Oliver mentioned, what we try to uh, add is this regional lens and understanding like FDI and global connectivity in a wider framework as the GDC framework. But link with the, with the regions in its very local manifestations. And what we really want to support, and this is what the panel will, uh, will discuss, is how we can bring an evidence base uh, to this conversation in terms of trying to understand what works in practice when regions, uh, cities, and national governments try to proactively engage with global function. That's not always uh, a bit over time. Um, so the book uh, is available already online, still not the, the physical copies. Uh, there is a, a QR code in all the invites. Uh, you can visit the book companion website and download uh, an electronic copy. It's completely free from all from the NSC uh, network uh, or request a copy uh, from us. We have some copies uh, to share. Um, let me take this opportunity to thank uh, the Regional Studies Association that supported our work and helped us reach the publication stage of this book, as well as uh, the speakers here, because the, this idea uh, was initiated by an OECD European Commission project that gave us like, the idea and the incentive to get started uh, with Oliver and think about uh, this book. So uh, thanks uh, for this. And I will leave immediately uh, to Vanessa. Thank you.
Thank you so much to our authors, and I'll get back to you in, in a little while. But now it's the turn to, to give the word to Anna Novik, please. I think it's on. It's on? Oh, yes. No, it's on. I don't need to. <laughs> well, first of all, good evening uh, to all of you. Yeah, this is better. Uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here in, the, in, the, in this school, and thanks, Ricardo, for inviting. And also, it's a pleasure to be with Peter, Joaquin, and Vanessa. Um, the, the, the idea, it's, um, what I want to say is that this report is true that it's very timely. You, you mentioned that it's very timely for the scenes that were mentioned before, in a way that uh, the GBC with the uh, with the supply and resilience uh, concept, with the economic security concept, with the due diligence concepts are, are, are important concepts that you need to manage to understand what is going on in terms of the discussion. But also because trade and investment should be a tool for something. And I think that the, uh, mixing this GBC with the regional development means that trade and investment is a tool for, for something else. And I, I will develop a little more that. Well, I want to divide my presentation in three. I want to do a couple of uh, comments of the book, but just a couple, link a little with the, the, the work that we are doing at the investment committee at the, at, the, at the OECD, and also share some personal views, because before being at the OECD, I worked for more than 20 years in the government of Chile, negotiating free trade agreements uh, on trade and on investment and many other things, but I think that also this trigger when you look back, when you are old enough, you look back and then I, I, I have some reflection that I would like to share. Um, I think that it's important for starting this conversation that we contextualize where we are right now. You, you know, we are just recovering from the COVID-19 and then the war in Ukraine put more pressure on, on, on the prices, on energy pr prices and, and, and in general, and then the economic situation is, is very complex and you will see tomorrow we will release also FDI trends that are going down. I mean that this is a good moment to have this discussion also because in some way we need to increase and then reinforce the economic and FDI trade is an important element to that. But again, we need also, it's not just quantity, it's also quality. That means that in a way, uh, trying to uh, uh, try to uh, reinforce the, 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 the behavior of this FDI. I want to just make two uh, main comments on the book, but it's maybe related with what I'm saying right now. Is one is the emphasis on the impact I think that uh, this, uh, I like this policy perspective that GBC could be reshaped in a way and then uh, um, forgetting something, forgetting sustainable development and regional development one, is one policy uh, in, in this way. And then also that it's not just that the companies are established, but how you embedded the companies in the, in, in the local part and then mm -hmm. make them to contribute to the local development. And I think that this is interesting because we have been also working on this topic also with, with Peter uh, Directory uh, in terms of how we link more multinational with SMEs and how we link more uh, that at the end is, is very, very related with what you are doing. And one, one important conclusion of this work is that you need to link uh, different policies. It's, uh, it's, it's not just different policies and this different institution if you want to really have impact. We have an initiative at the OECD that is the FDA Qualities Policy Toolkit and the FDA Qualities Indicator. And what we try to measure is what is the impact of FDI, a picture, on innovation and productivity, on green, on gender, and job quality. And uh, what we see there is that it's not automatic. The impact is not automatic. You need to do policies and you need to mix institutions if you want to really uh, make these changes. There is one element that I want to say, and then I will go a little, that is this local unit uh, um, suggestion that you said, the local unit company. When, when we developed this work uh, with, the, with, with Peter and with the people in the, at the OECD, we realized that there are different ways of coordinating. And not necessarily always you need to create new uh, unit but, or new institution, but what you want to have is that better information, mm -hmm. better mechanism that at the end in the practice could go there. Mm -hmm. Let me present a little, some little funding that we have, not too many, but some, because it's, uh, we, we have been working on this m and &E, SME linkage, and there we have some, uh, more information, and then also how we embedded a little the GBC 
now in the regional and in the Europe development. But it's true that the, we started to feel more demand from our communities, the policy communities that are broader. In the investment committee, we are like more than 38 OECD countries. We are 61 because of, it's, you accept non-OECD members that they want to know more how we can, how we, they can increase the impact on, on, on FDI in, in, the, in, their, in their countries and, and in their regions. And we just last year, last week, launched a, a, a little report, a, a, a report that was a background report for having a good discussion with investment promotion agencies. The OECD invest, have a network of investment promotion agencies. Ricardo was there also uh, to, to present something. And then what we did is we did a, a comparative analysis of regional FDI disparities in OECD countries and also we examine how national investment promotions support regional development through a survey. We sent a survey today before, and then we also compile a little of that. And let me focus a little on the FDA regional disparity. We know that FDA can be a powerful engine to help remote and less developed regions. Uh, the, the, the FDA quality indicators that I showed you demonstrate that uh, they can create jobs, foster productivity, enhance skill and innovation. But again, attracting investment outside the main economic hub has become a major challenge because again, it's not automatic. That means that FDA concentrated in major hub only, it could be even exacerbated the already existing regional disparity. And this is what we find, looking at the characteristic of OECD region, uh, what we find is that the Greenfield FDI in the past two decades, it showed that regions of the top 10 have on average a GDP per capita 2.3 times larger than the bottom 10 of the regions. They are 10 times more populated and 3.6 times more on uh, research and development on uh, and that the regions that are kind of like behind. I mean that similarly when we ask OECDI about what they need to attract is the same issue that you mentioned, skills and infrastructure that normally are in the sectors that are in the regions that are not the ones that are more mm -hmm. uh, developed. Uh, that means that uh, this show that these uh, FDA disparities are driven by this imbalance within rather than between countries, huh? because uh, the lower investment barriers have bring all the countries more uh, less kind of uh, diverse, but the disparities in, within the countries are, has been increasing, uh, particularly in the last year. Uh, let me a little present uh, something about, because I don't want to take too much time, but I want to present something about the, 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 the IPAS, because I think that the investment promotion agencies is, is very important. There is one element that we were discussing in this document, and I think that it's also very related with you, your uh, work, is that uh, the, region, the regional dimension is a dimension that is not super strong in the IPAS. But, and, and even though that the majority of these IPAS consider regional development as a top priority, when you ask them if regional development is a top priority for more than 90% of the national IPAS, uh, and the majority of them have some regional dimension, when we start to look how they measure, they don't have a lot of good indicators. They, they, the key pay indicators that they use to measure their work, I mean that this is one element. But in addition, I think that there is a, a, an isolated way of looking at this issue, that in, that in a way the coordination between the, region, the regional authorities and the investment promotion at the subnational level are not kind of coordinated in a way that make effective this kind of stuff. And I think that this is a big challenge for all policymakers, that they look their things in a more silo way. The, the work that the, the investment promotion agency have is to attract investment. And the key, the main indicator for measuring their kind of activities is do they attract it or not to their, their local place. But not how I make this attraction something that impact the regional development and the people and the job quality and this kind of stuff. And, and then the local authorities need to also help this kind of investment promotion in developing the local conditions that are necessary for that. I mean that this is something that emerged as a good discussion and because this is a very exciting work, we will do some kind of joint work uh, with the regional development community at the OECD. Finally, and with that I will finish, I just want to share my experience because when you negotiate, but I, I'm, I told you that I'm old enough to negotiate, like I, I started to negotiate agreements in the 90s. And in the 90s, maybe because the ideological period that we were living at that time, like we were focused on opening the trade and investment and free trade agreements were a 
super good tool for that, you know, because you negotiate market access, you liberalize, you like facilitate this kind of uh, movement. And in Chile, uh, I really observed that in the last 30 years, like uh, the poverty decreased in, a, in, a, in an impressive way. And, and, and also I would say that the, 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 the country grow 6% average for, for a long time. However, the, if you see right now the issue of the job skill, the quality of the job, the spillover of the environment, and also the inequality was not there. And, and I would say that probably when I reflect right now, I think that this is because we were thinking that someone else will take care of that. You know, we are here negotiating this part and someone else will take care of that. And what, what in reality happened is there they, they are not someone else because in a way you need to link from, the, from this kind of policies to other policies if you want to have impact. And now it's important because I see that it's not that you need to be against the globalization or co against trade and investment, but how you make this as a tool and how you mix policies and institutions in an effective way that these elements are kind of tools for getting what you want that is sustainable development. That's all. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. <laughs> Peter Berkowitz, please. Yes, thank you. Um, am I close enough to the mic? You can hear me? Yeah. Well, just to add to Anna, it's a great pleasure to, to be with you this evening. Uh, also, I know you're keen, Ricardo and Oliver. Um, we've been working together for a long time, and it's, it's really great to see this being put on the table as a real part of the policy discussion. And that's what I want to focus on today. Um, from a European perspective, um, really on uh, some, some key trends, some key, and I'm, I'm going to make three points. Um, and the first point is that at the European level, we are really facing a changing political landscape in terms of thinking about GBCs. And if we look where we are now compared to 10 years ago, it's almost 180 degrees. And there have been long-term trends which have pushed this. Um, the industrialization and related issues, the impact of automation, artificial intelligence, offshoring and onshoring. The Green Deal, Ricardo mentioned the Green Deal. Um, this is transforming the way in which Europe thinks about its economy and society in a perspective to 2050. It's about decarbonization of the economy, shortening product cycles in terms, in terms of promoting circularity, shifts in energy consumption and production patterns and it is something which is being driven both by technology and top-down needs, but also by consumer preferences. So it's, it's, it's a big shift, and this is really influencing the distribution of activities within a range of value chains. And then finally, and we haven't talked about it really, there's the geopolitics of trade policy, um, notably vis-a-vis -vis China, but of course we have a big trader which has been promoting America first policies in quite a strong way. Um, and uh, together, these have led a kind of a, you know, the, the pot has started bubbling. And what has really pushed things has been the recent set of crises that, um, that Ricardo highlighted, where people were able to see in their day-to-day -day life the impact of misfunctioning value chains, of supply chains, whether it was in terms of health, masks, paracetamol, during the COVID crisis. Now, the invasion of Ukraine, everyone thinks about energy, but also basics like fertilizers. Mm -hmm. um, you see discussions of food um, poverty in developing countries, in the press, and the way we choose it. So, so all of these factors have pushed policymakers at a European level in a new direction. And there's a new concept uh, which is floating around and it has different names. Um, but the concept is of strategic autonomy in, in sensitive areas. And what this means is that there are certain value chains which are, are vulnerable, uh, and therefore you need to, to try and create the environment in terms of industrial analysis through different types of public support, what might be called realistic trade policy. Mm -hmm. Um, and the examples which are most obvious are hydrogen, batteries, microchips, but there are others. 
So there's a real discussion not only about value chains but of the policies that, that, are, that, are, that are there at a European level. My second point. Um, there is also a recognition, I think Anna alluded to it, that um, you know, this is not all good. That there are you know, negative externalities associated with these transformations. And that the changes in value chains, but also policies, can have strong asymmetric impacts. Now the asymmetric impacts which we are familiar with in the literature is very much uh, on employment, inequality, poverty, but there is also a very, very strong territorial impact. And I'm just going to give you some examples of, of these kind of territorial <coughs> impacts. In Europe, FDI has been a, perhaps the strongest element in driving convergence in Europe in the past 30 years, and certainly in terms of the integration of Central and Eastern Europe into, into, into the mainstream of the European economy. All of these changes are going to have an impact on these regions, on the patterns of FDI. And the story of FDI is unlikely to be the same in the future that it was in the past. Um, in, in particular, because of the competitiveness factors that made many of these locations attractive in the past. The second thing is that we are seeing increasing evidence of limited spillover benefits uh, to local economies, uh, particularly in terms of upgrading of innovation, human capital, and, and more generally business ecosystems. Um, the benefits of FDI were seen in an earlier stage at a more macro level. But at the micro level, we are seeing less and less benefits. So I can give you a lot of examples at, at a later point in time. But equally, the policy instruments on the discussion also can have uh, strongly asymmetrical impact. So let me just give you two, two examples. In Europe, we have something called IPCEIs. These are uh, important projects of uh, community economic interest. And once you have a, an identified sector, then there are lots of things that come from it. Public funding, state aid in particular. Now the thing about state aid support to companies is it depends very much on your ability, your fiscal capacity to provide support. And it depends where the companies are located. So what we see is that in many of these new EPCIs, um, the main focus is in the richest parts of Europe, which have the strongest industrial base, who also have the capacity to support their companies. So we're seeing a new type of almost agglomeration effect in Europe. Uh, the same thing goes for research activities. Um, research activities, which are generally run on a competitive basis, uh, go to the places which are best at doing research. These are not your small rural communities or your, your areas which have branch plants in them. So la last point um, is that we're seeing in the context of regional development policies in Europe, what I'm responsible for, an increasing recognition, recognition that we have to take into account this external dimension. Now we have something called smart specialization. Some of it may may heard of it, some of you may not have heard of it, but it's essentially the, the idea that every region has a distinct uh, development pathway, particularly in relation to, to innovation. And we've been working on this for a long time, and it's you know, pretty well accepted in the literature, but I think one of the major lessons that we've learned over the last several years is that an economic development strategy which doesn't look outside the region and the member state um, is essentially you know, a, a, a stool with two legs. It's really missing an essential part of it. Um, the other thing is that in something as big and complex as the European uh, Union, the single market, there are lots of opportunities for complementarities. Uh, and this is offers other types of uh, opportunities in terms of specialization. And also the possibility to link with EU level initiatives. And this is very much um, a, uh, an area where we are, we've got our Lego kit out and we're building new things. We've got a new policy instrument which we have developed, uh, which is pretty unique in the world, which is actually designed to connect ecosystems uh, together. But it's an experiment, it's an experiment. Um, um, but fits very much into this value chain logic. And then perhaps the last, the last thing I, I wanted to 
say, and this comes out very, very strongly from, from, from the book, is if we're thinking about economic development policies, if we're thinking about upgrading, if we're thinking about future-looking reasons of own policies, we need to focus much more strongly on intangibles, investing in intangibles, not investing so much in physical capital, on, although nothing makes a local politician happier than a road. Um, we need to focus on institutions, and we need to focus on human capital. And none of this will work without the necessary reform efforts to make sure that your markets and your institutions function. So, just to conclude, um, this is really a new area of policy activity. Um, you're listening to a kind of a, a policy unfolding in, in real time. And I think that the book is really a great contribution, um, both in academic terms, but also, perhaps more importantly, for potentially policy makers at national and subnational level who are interested in getting that out. Thank you, Peter. Joaquim Oliveira, please. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, I think, first of all, really, all my congrats because this is uh, this is a great work and I've been uh, waiting for such a book for a long time um, and uh, I think there are at least two teams uh, with which have been sort of involved that um, that really need this kind of input regional policy and SME policy because I was working in the in the center for uh, uh, regional urban policy and also SME policy at OECD so uh, at the OECD, we produced uh, a lot, a lot of evidence showing this role of what we call tradable sectors, the OPTES, uh, being engaged with tradable sectors as the drivers of regional uh, productivity catching up. This is very important, of course, because we know that at the regional level we have these huge disparities, these agglomeration effects. So any forces that help this kind of uh, uh, elevator mechanism increasing productivity are very important. So tradable sectors uh, play that kind of, uh, of role, and even you know there is evidence in the literature showing that this effect is a bit unconditional. I mean, even if you are not completely uh, you know with the best institutions and the best sort of uh, administrative capacity, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, this kind of uh, uh, engagement with tradable sectors is a sort of uh, elevator of productivity, right? So this is very important for regions which lack of capacity, and precisely the lagging regions, they have this kind of uh, problems. And it's not only an issue uh, of countries, it's an issue of things, regions, differences in, in regions inside countries, right? So up to recently, uh, you know, the, 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 the kind of low density regions, the density, the, 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 the regions don't have, the big cities don't benefit from these agglomeration effects, could not develop services non-tradables, right? Uh, because precisely these services up to now, they uh, demanded a lot of proximity between production producers and consumers. So of course, these things are in big cities. Huh? They, they like density, right? So uh, this, uh, these regions, because they, they, were, uh, uh, they were kind of not in a good uh, position to develop large service sectors, they needed these tradable sectors, and in particular, tradable uh, goods. Of course, all this is changing because of these uh, new trends in the service sector, delocalization of services, this possibility to produce distant uh, services, also, of course, the teleworking. So this is for regional policy. So the case for this uh, openness, this tradability of the regions is very important. On SMEs, very quickly, you know, the SMEs don't have scale. Otherwise, they will not be SMEs, right? Probably the SMEs on average don't have a lot of scale economies, okay? Uh, scale economies is a very important source of productivity, right? Uh, we also know by statistics that the SMEs are not very engaged in, uh, in international trade. Most of trade of countries is actually big companies, as you probably know. And also they have a much lower adoption of, uh, of technology than large companies. So, for SMEs, if you don't have scale, you don't have trade, you don't have technology, of course you have a productivity problem. Of course, uh, not surprising. And SMEs, on average, is 
don't know, 50, 60, even in some countries, probably in my country, Portugal, is, is, is almost 70%, and even really micro, micro enterprises. So not surprising either that the, that the country may have an pro overall aggregate productivity problem if 60 or 70% of your employment, of your labor force, is in, uh, uh, with entities don't, that have this productivity problem. So again, this exposure to SMEs to internationalization, very important because very often trade and technology uh, go together. But, but the problem is that entering in tradable sectors is not so easy, right? In some sectors you have huge uh, sort of uh, entry, uh, entry uh, sort of blockages, uh, some costs, uh, you, know, uh, you know, entry uh, so costs related, for example, with the kind of R&D investment that you need to do uh, you know, to enter a market, etc., etc. So <laughs> you don't have the choice. You need to connect with these international production uh, networks. The book mentioned actually this, um, this kind of uh, uh, raw weight of these big companies in international trade. So uh, you say 50%, this is more or less World Bank figures. The OECD had some, done, uh, done some estimates around 60%. UNCTAD, I think, was in 2013, they even go with 80% of trade, international trade, in a way or another, direct, indirectly, is related to multinational companies. So indeed, the kind of figure that, uh, that you presented uh, with uh, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, wine and textiles of, uh, was another Ricardo, right? <laughs> this thing is gone completely. So now it's international, uh, multinational companies, right? Uh, and, and that's it. So either you are in or you are out. You are out, uh, well, it's, it's, it's very difficult to benefit from this role of trade laws. Um, the other problem with this, uh, with this uh, issue of uh, participating in this uh, um, international global production networks is that there is also evidence that is work done on this, that at the beginning, this is, this is really good. Huh? No, this is why you were right, you know, this, <laughs> it's not always rosy, so it, this is really good, of course, but at the beginning you lose, you tend to lose local content. So actually before engaging in these uh, networks you had higher value added content and then because of this smiley curve that uh, Oliver also showed at the, at the beginning, the smiley curve, you know, the, the, the powerful countries you know, tend to be in the extremes of the curve and the other ones go in the, in the middle. The middle is where you produce lower, lower value added. Um, in my country, for example, in Portugal, we had huge, were exposed to huge trade shocks, late 90s, uh, you know, the integration of Eastern and European economies and then the opening of, of trade to China. Uh, so huge trade shocks for a little country like Portugal and Portugal need to reinvent themselves in its, this openness and to trade need to be reinvented, of course, we integrated uh, uh, GVCs, but we, 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 we lost uh, this uh, value-added uh, content uh, for the moment. Although there are some signs, for example, in the north of Portugal, there are now some uh, German companies, for example, that delocalized R&D facilities in Portugal. So this is not anymore exploiting low uh, uh, low, uh, uh, low skills, uh, low wages, etc., etc. So things are, are, are changing. So all this, uh, in a nutshell, is that you need to have a strategy. You need to have a strategy. So it's important, but uh, you know, has, has some complications. So you need to have a strategy. So in particular, I think the book shows very well that uh, the regional strategies are important because firms, the private sector, is place-based. Only governments can be space-blind. Only national ministries can do policies in a totally, well, some policies need to be uniform, of course. But only these, you know, some, these ministries can be completely blind to space, right? Companies, they decide where they want to locate. So they are very sen sensitive to local conditions, spatial arbitrage for the choice location of their investments. So policymakers need to be equipped, equipped with a good understanding what their regions have to offer. Don't ask them what they need, but what they have to offer, what is perhaps sometimes unique in one region that doesn't exist elsewhere, and the kind of opportunities generated by, uh, uh, by uh, FDI and by integration in these global networks. I think the book is really a, a great contribution in this, uh, in this respect. And you said at some point that the GVCs have Denatalized comparative advantage. I like. I don't know if this is actually an English term. Denatalized. I don't know. 
<laughs> but you understand what it means. So this makes indeed location uh, much more fundamental. For example, uh, the local spillovers depend on the capacity to absorb technology and location in the production chain. And uh, so, for example, the work that you have developed show that in some, in some cases, for example, it's better to, not to, to, to engage with a very big company, but it's better to engage with sort of a smaller, perhaps intermediate company, because uh, this provides a much more resilient uh, relationship uh, over time. So one of the messages of the book, which I find uh, really very, very important, is that it's not the skill, the technology intensity of sectors or product that matters, but the ones of tasks. This for policymakers is a very important one because they want to change, for example, the pattern of specialization in the regions. They said we are caught in this kind of a, a low, uh, low value added sectors or products, uh, of course, natural resources. Don't, 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 but, so they want to diversify. But actually, in this logic, it's not the product or the sector that matters, it's actually the task. So you can still produce textiles, but have very very tasty, very interesting segments of this textile sector in my country. No, in Portugal, there are very few textile companies, but they are indeed in this very kind of uh, uh, high skill uh, segments of the market. I also find this book, uh, and this is a bit too also to this idea of strategic autonomy. So I am advisor of the commission, so I of course endorse completely uh, this, uh, this philosophy. But I also worked for 30 years at OECD, so I like uh, uh, free trade. And uh, uh, I think we have in these days uh, a lot of discourse about protectionism, right? Um, we know that sometimes this may be justified, but we also know it's very difficult to do this protectionism in an intelligent way, right? Um, and I find that some proposals for relocation of industries and uh, industrial policy just fail to understand uh, how these things globally uh, work. All these production networks uh, uh, work globally. So I'm in favor of strategic autonomy, but on the other hand, there are things that you cannot completely recognize. We are now in a, con a different uh, context of uh, David Ricardo with, uh, with, uh, with kind of this uh, comparative advantage. For example, uh, no, yesterday there was you know, a discussion about uh, uh, you know, industries in France, the role of electric cars. If you are protectionist in batteries, you may have problems to produce uh, uh, competitive electric cars, for example. Right? You cannot uh, relocalize everything. This is the role of trade, you know, finding the, <laughs> the places where things can be produced in a more efficient and uh, cheap way. So uh, at the end, this protectionism can even sort of uh, hinder both the domestic production of some products because you need to import uh, uh, the intermediate goods and also can hinder the energy environmental transition, for example. So we need to be careful. So I think the book is also a very good way of presenting again in a very articulate and, uh, and forceful manner uh, the, the, the role of globalization, huh, Ricardo? Huh? Which now, uh, and we know that globalization was put into question this, uh, this backlash against globalization came from the bottom up from the regions because of geography of, of discontent, right? So, uh, just to finish, uh, you know, but you, you already, Anna, you already said very interesting stuff about that, and perhaps this is my only criticism to the book, is that, you know, your role uh, for these regional investment agencies, these people that in some sense appropriate these strategies, but they need to coordinate a lot of uh, different stuff. Uh, a lot of different types of policies, uh, engage with the private sector, all kinds of stakeholders, the, even the academia, local so policy uh, makers. Uh, this is about governance. And perhaps, I mean, this is not a criticism, actually. This is actually a call for more work. Uh, perhaps I would, would like to see more work on these multi-level governance arrangements that would make the life of these uh, uh, important uh, intermediaries, the in, in regional investment agencies, uh, really really effective. Uh, fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, really, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Joachim. Uh, just very quick reactions, perhaps, Oliver and Ricardo. 
I will, I will be very quick, and I want to just touch on something, I'll only to touch on something Peter said, but I also want to criticise the book, which you should do it, so at all launches, right? But uh, I think this kind of question on, you know, the inequality and some of these negative consequences, um, we, yeah, we need, to, we need to address, and we kind of are addressing more, and I think, you know, a lot of it drives a kind of socioeconomic upgrading, but it took me a while to realize that it could go the other way as well, right? You, there is downgrading as well. There are these kind of negative consequences, maybe beyond, you know, sorry, I'm going to turn myself off, but uh, uh, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, there are these kind of consequences socially, environmentally, that kind of are also associated with these um, global value chains. And I think that's something we are, we are trying to uh, contribute to as well, to, to kind of make sure we're getting that balance, I suppose. And, uh, Harnessing them in, in the most positive way, upgrading, but not um, not downgrading. Because I think that's the subtitle we have, right? How to upgrade through regional policy, FDI, and trade. And I think it should be brackets and not downgrade. Ricardo. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you all for your comments. I mean, it's uh, there are so many like ideas, and part of this can really form like an agenda for for our research. Just like a, an important point of what Anna was saying about free trade agreements in the 1990s and the idea that free trade would, uh, as well as FDI, what, what Peter was mentioning about Central Eastern Europe, will automatically like, bring economic development and benefits on the ground. And what we argue, in, what the evidence is showing is that these, uh, these, these impacts might have materialized on a national level, but then not really materialize on, on a local level and might be an important driver for regional inequalities. So we need, like what we try to argue in the book is really like we need to go a step further and create the framework for these global opportunities to flow to the regions, but when we need to proactively think about the generation of benefits and how we transform these into inclusive opportunities. And the idea, like the, the, the reference to the local content units, is not really the idea that we should create additional bodies, but it's really the idea of changing, for example, the targets of in existing bodies that cannot, are not necessarily like regional investment promotion agencies, can be bodies within the regional, the regional governments. In different countries, these bodies take different configurations. So the, the proposal is not really to create additional transaction costs, to create new bodies but really to understand what is the mandate of the existing bodies, how to endow them with the correct KPIs, to the, with the correct objectives, going beyond simple attraction, but thinking proactively in terms of how to engage and how to create the connections, as well as on how they can play a role, for example, in the digital and green transition. So it's, it's a matter of something that is not necessarily like an expensive policy. It's not necessarily something that requires the creation of something new. So that might make the policy not particularly popular for policymakers that like roads, bridges, and employment. Uh, in particular close to, 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 to elections, but what we really like, uh, the, the publicly funded employment, what, what we mean is that instead this can be created by streamlining and giving the correct incentives to uh, existing, uh, existing uh, public bodies. Uh, and, and this can be like, also a means to generate uh, an inclusive model of internationalization when we think about reshaping global value chains also in front of the, the, the challenges that we are facing at the moment with the changing geopolitical landscape. Um, and so that's very important example that Joaquin brought in on, about Portugal I mean, it's really like a mess. It is possible to upgrade. Upgrading is possible. And I think an important message that is what Joaquin was highlighting is the focus on tasks. So it's not really like a lot of also the smart specialization narrative has been, OK, you should branch out into this sector or this other sector and then looking for similarities across sectors. This can be like an interesting exercise. But what we are proposing is something different. Is really you can really like change your value addition within the sectors that already form the strength of the local economy. And so your objective is not really seeing how you diversify into different sectors. It can be part of your strategy, but there is an important consideration to be given in terms of what is your position in the existing sectors that characterize the local economy and what the value addition opportunities can be. Excellent. So I'll just make a, a, a brief comment uh, in relation to, to my background also for, uh, from 25 years of, of doing public policy in my native Mexico and engaged in, in free trade agreements, negotiation and implementation. I think there's also a paradox in terms of 
diversification and you having sometimes the very difficult uh, decision that in practical terms it's, it, it is very easy to, to do, which is whether uh, participating in global value chains or participating in regional value chains internationally. No? And I'm speaking from a country that trades $1.4 million every minute with the United States. No? So, so the, 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 the issue there in practice is that it's easier to follow the path that is always there. That's why we have passed in the last 20 years from being 90% concentrated in the US to being 80% concentrated in the US. Mm -hmm. so, so still when we negotiated the Pacific Alliance Treaty with Mexico, Colombia, Chile, and Peru, it's still, the, the whole infrastructure is there, but it's easier said than done in terms of actually doing that diversification process, no? Mm -hmm. Just just a comment. And now I, I open the floor to your, to your questions, comments, please. Raise your hands. I will take uh, two and then uh, ask our uh, speakers to, to have some brief uh, reactions to them. So over there, please, the first one. Yes, so I and You can like identify yourself, please. It's Ishita here and studying a Master of Public Policy. So I really want to hear your viewpoint around uh, the early stage of weaponization of interdependencies and you know choke points in the global value chain. And we can see it all over the place, the control on export and uh, control on technology transfer to specific countries, probably I'll name it China from the US. And so this at the same point leads to you know a transient uh, regional development but can cause a fragmentation and localization which is against the essence of FTA. So yeah. That, yeah. Thank you, Jita. Another question, so I can take two at the same time. Yes, please. Thanks. Um, Daisy Payne, and I'm here as a willing member of the public. Um, I'm, well, thank you very much for the presentations. They were great. I'm very excited to read the book. I've been looking forward to it for a long time. Um, my, I was quite interested in the greening global value chains uh, part of the uh, presentation. Um, previously, I've worked with large multinationals who are looking to green their supply chains, and often there's uh, a sort of fear of doing so, fear of being a first mover, or there's uh, a sort of reluctancy to change from the path that's already there to, to stick with older systems that are sometimes not as green. Um, or there's the other camp that very much want to uh, go green but just don't know how to do it. They don't know uh, enough about their supply chains. They don't know sort of, it's, it's a very opaque supply chain, right? So they want to do it, but they just don't know how. So my question is, uh, is there an example in the book of a particularly uh, green global value chain that could inspire others to, to want to get involved? If that is not in the book, I would ask the authors uh, what would that look like and, in your opinion, uh, what would a green global value chain look like that is aligned with sustainable development goals, climate goals, nature goals, um, net zero goals, I think you mentioned as well. Thank you. Thank you. So now, please, uh, anyone uh, wanting to take the word first, and I, I would ask our our panelists to make a, a brief answer so we can also have more interactions with, with the public here. And of course, there will be more time in the cocktail to engage directly with, with the panel. If, if you want, I can, I can start, but uh, I, I think that the, 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 the things that are happening, I'm, I'm worried about the things that are happening more when you are in a multilateral organization that you are trying to coordinate and then to have the trade and investment integration. This has been our kind of, uh, I would say, the, the OECD, and the OECD that is not global, but we are trying, or we, we try in particular in this topic to be more global. And there are a lot of concepts right now that are emerging, and this is economic security, economic coercion, to the, to, and, and then it's, it's creating this kind of trade and investment in a way that uh, it's a little more complicated in a way, there are fragmentation right now, and also in the investment there are uh, mechanisms of screening investment that these were not very popular in the past and now are very, very, are all European countries are having that, Australia, Japan. The world is getting complex in that way. I don't think, and I agree with uh, Joachim uh, that he mentioned that before, that we will completely kind of 
breaking blocks like we did in the Cold War because the world today is very integrated. And then you have kind of huge, uh, uh, there are a lot of developing countries that depends on the, on, the, on the United States or on the Western and on the China trade and investment. I mean that I don't think that the things will be really going back to the kind of Cold War right now, but what I think that this will change is that the GBC are reshaping, as was mentioned in the book, and, and, and I think that probably there are some sectors that are the technological sector that will be a real fragmentation there. Uh, but we are, we are not, we are experiencing this, we are trying to understand that at the OECD in terms of what does it mean uh, in terms of uh, impact, but, uh, but we're in the middle of the process and that, that means that let's see what it goes. Regarding the green value chain, um, it's, uh, there are new regulations on due diligence uh, in, in, in Europe, but also in other, in other countries that in a way apply to, that I, the due diligence concept is, came from the responsible business conduct concept. That it means that in a way you not only need to take care about your direct operation, in a way what is the impact that your operations are doing on environment and skill in a direct, but also in the supply chain. That means that in a way you need to take care or at least measure the risk that means to buy products that are uh, in, the, in the supply chain and then also in, ensure that these pieces of product are not contaminated, are not created a negative impact in the environment. That means that I see that the world is going there, but there are some debates huh? because it's, it's true that it's, it's costly. And then is the issue of the SMEs, the issues of developing countries. But the world is, is going there, I would say. The, the issue is how, when, and with which rhythm. And the diligence will help on, on that movement on green. Oliver? Uh, yeah, to that question on green global value chains, page 111. <laughs> I, would, uh, <laughs> I knew it was near the end. No, I think, um, and to detail it a bit more, I think. Uh, we speak about these kind of three drivers, I suppose, like the firms driving them, the markets driving them, and the governments driving them. And I think you spoke about what would that kind of potentially look like. There's a kind of quite nice um, evidence from over 108 countries over seven years that found this kind of international trade is with the adoption of some environmental regulation, ISO 1401, which I actually knew before writing this book. I think it was quite an important bit, but the export, it was kind of the, the exporting firms who are like closer to green global value chains had increased kind of incentives to adopt that um, certification and they saw that adoption at an increasing rate. So this kind of environmental accreditation permeated through the global value chains via kind of the lead firms calling for it, I suppose, or at least kind of indicating this was something of importance and we're seeing this a lot more now. And I think on the, you kind of, there's a question, the second part about kind of go green but unknown. I mean, of course, in LSE, we're going to say, do uh, get people to do the research. And this is what actually the government in Thailand did. And there's a nice example in there where they kind of mapped themselves on the global value chain. So looked at, again, it's a national, not regional example, but we can't always find a regional example. And looked at the way they stat on this global value chain so with respect to um, agriculture, I believe. And, look, and actually understood, OK, there are these um, different kind of, kind of bio-agricultural value chains that we can move into that will provide a higher value add um, compared to what we're existing doing. And there's some like numbers in there that I think were quite interesting. And that kind of helped determine the strategy on how they were going to develop into the green global value chain. But I think it's work, yeah, we, we still want to do more on because I think it's quite important. But these are like interesting kind of tidbits of, or examples, how uh, it, the process can begin. I can take a couple of questions more if there's any or if you prefer to make them outside, that's also fine. Yes, please. Okay, perfect. Um, so, Kartik online asks, um, the emphasis on global value change is on cost efficiency. Do you think it's a useful tool for developing countries to improve long-term competitiveness and move up the value chain? Yes, I didn't understand well the question. I can take the first answer. I mean, I think, I think the, the, the question was whether a value chain approach is something which can be a useful policy tool 
for less developed countries, but also for mm. less developed regions, um, compared to other countries. Mm. And I, I think the first part of that answer for me is that you have to get the basics right. You know, if, if the basics are not right, um, in terms of institutions, in terms of markets, in terms of other things, mm. you know, value chains will not save you, you will end up with very exploitative mm. value chains, uh, which we had from the uh, 15th to the 19th century. Um, so, you know, I think that, that's the first part of the question. I think the second part of the question is that absolutely, absolutely, because we live in a world where trade is a fact. Mm and value um, is distributed. And you have to find ways as a developing region, as a developing country, of building the capacities that allow you to find your position in value creation. And I think that there have been some very, very positive examples, and I'm sure Anna, mm. you can, you can, you can give, of, of, of where this has actually been at the core of a development strategy of, of a country. No, no, I think, but it's, I just can confirm what you are saying. Huh? We, we have many cases, huh? Thailand and Vietnam, textile, how they are doing that. I, I, I just want to say, that because I, I completely agree, I think that the, the, the institution, the, the policy, the basic policy need to be there, because if not, we will not create the development that you want to create uh, we, and participate in the, in the global value chain. But it's true that allow, and this is the, I think that this is what exactly is in the book, that in a way this is a tool that is not just for developed or regional like uh, Europe is for if is for developing countries in the developing country has 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 I think that taking much more uh, advantage of this has been grown more and you see right now that uh, the, there is a more developing south south trade south investment trade and it's, it's, it's also thanks to the the global value chain I mean that it is a policy tool it's a it's a policy for development but again, we need to link with other policies. This is the only thing. You need to have basic institution, basic, but also link. And then it's, it's engaging in GBC, but using GBC also as a way of regional development, as a way of job skills, as a way of with other policies that allow, that are real, real tools of development. Tracking. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Very quickly, you know, any policy like engagement in, uh, in global chains is only a necessary condition. We never find necessary and sufficient conditions. So, uh, you know, uh, at the beginning, maybe a sort of almost a, a necessary and sufficient condition when it is a bottleneck. For example, you, no trade, you cannot develop, um, full stop, right? But you start engaging uh, in trade, and uh, now in, in all days, in, in, engaged in trade means engaging in, in global value chains. And then uh, you see that in some cases it works, and in other cases it doesn't work. So it's a necessary but not sufficient, right? And so what explains that in some cases it works and in other cases it doesn't work is precisely this, in, in this case I agree with the word strategic, strategic complementarity with other, with other sectors, and in particular in the trade literature, there was a lot of work indeed in the complementarity between trade and other kinds of policies that make countries benefit from the openness. So I think that's, uh, for me, is perhaps the most... Uh, it's complicated because it's about interactions, it's about a package of policies rather than one single policy, but this is the way it works. And very often, you know, this talks about the, what you call pe people talk about the middle income trap. Huh? So countries develop, they are in the middle of the process, they did a lot of stuff right, and still they are stuck there. Very often, this has to do with some other areas, some other domains that were not sufficiently developed. And so this blocked the whole thing. You know, very intuitively, in, in, in a system where everything is very complementary, one single thing that is very weak brings the whole thing down. So this, I think, is really the, the kind of the the complicated message that I think you made it in a very kind of a clear, articulated way that really can be useful for policymakers. Because it's not easy to talk about this coordination, it's not easy to talk about this multi-level governance mechanism, but at the end, this is what makes the difference. I don't want to 
want to do advertising of my work, but it's true that the FDA quality policy toolkit, look at about that, because I think that this is exactly what we are trying to do. I'm trying to move that agenda in the OECD in this way, because I agree with Joaquin, this is the way to go, and it's not easy. It's not easy because we are, you, we are experts and we are silos, and then how you see the things from the different lens without like really looking for the other lens. And I think that it's good to, that you are young people because I think that you will be more ready than, <laughs> than us in a way that to be an expert but not this limiting you to look at the things from your perspective. You are an expert, but you need to see how the other expert look that because the, to solving these complex challenges that we have, that is the climate change, all the complex challenges that we have, we need different perspective, but really looking together to solve this issue. And then, yeah, policies and institutional is key. Please join me. Oh, yes. Uh, just yeah, one yeah. comment on the, on, these, on, the, on the cost efficiency <laughs> nature of, uh, of global value chains. And oh, yes. the idea that we advance in the book that value, global value chains are not only about cost efficiency, but also about knowledge efficiency. So we have shown also with, with work the idea that different in, uh, segments of the value chain l try to achieve different types of objectives in the local economies. And therefore, they can be like a stepping stone for uh, economic development through knowledge and, and, and innovation. However, it's very important, that hence, like the policy messages, like to select the right uh, ways to engage with global value chains in such a way that you don't get trapped into this cost efficiency part of the value chain. So that, that's the whole idea of, of upgrading. However, in particular, when it comes to developing countries, emerging economies, that's the work that we have done on uh, Chinese, so South-South investment, Chinese investment in Ethiopia, what we do find that the FDI create patterns uh, of winners and losers. So we do find that some firms are uh, um, uh, damaged by the global interaction because of a fundamental competition effect. However, the suppliers, those that are able to enter the supply chain, are the ones that benefit and, and expand. And when we try and measure the overall like local economic development impact in the area, so going beyond the input-output linkages and looking with the uh, satellite night lights uh, at the overall uh, economic development impact, we find that there is a medium-term positive impact. So there is like a moment, if you want, of creative destruction, but if the, the, the policy, the framework with the uh, quality FDI is set right, then there are uh, local economic development opportunities to be uh, harnessed mm -hmm. by, by, by local economies. So I was asked to be the time police, and at this point, <laughs> uh, please join me in thanking our wonderful panel. <laughs> and Total is out there. Thank you. Thank you.